everyone. My name is Daryl Heller. I'm the director of the IU South Bend Civil Rights Heritage Center, and I'd like to welcome everyone here as we kick off um, Black History Month for 2023. And we have such a wonderful start to it with um, an amazing poet artist, uh, Natasha Trethaway. Um, we also have several other events happening over the course of the month. So you, if you'll grab a flyer in the back and please join us for many more events um, as we carry out this celebration for the month of July, I mean the month of February that we call Black History Month, but we'll be doing things all year round because we know that Black History is all year. <laughs> it's not just the month. And um, what I'm trying to get across to a lot of folks is that African-American history is American history um, and we need to recognize it as such. Um, and that's kind of one of our, our challenges is to open up that conversation. Um, I don't have much to say because I'm not, you didn't come here to see me. I'm gonna bring Mark Sanders, um, the director of the Initiative for Race and Resilience at Notre Dame, who was co-sponsoring this event with us um, to introduce our guest. Good evening. I hope you all are doing well. If you haven't already done so, uh, please silence your cell phones. Um, as Daryl said, I'm Mark Sanders, professor of English and Africana Studies at the University of Notre Dame. I have the honor of chairing the Department of Africana Studies and directing the Initiative on Race and Resilience. And in that capacity, I have the privilege of introducing Natasha Trethaway, this year's artist in residence at the Initiative on Race. I want to thank Daryl Heller and the Civil Rights Heritage Center for partnering with the Initiative on Race and for hosting this reading. The Notre Dame Initiative on Race and Resilience consists of a community of scholars, artists, and students united in the ongoing struggle to dismantle systemic racism and support communities of color. Global in scope, comparative and interdisciplinary and critical approach, the initiative creates a space, intellectual, psychic and physical, where our community gathers in solidarity to exchange ideas, develop projects and celebrate the expressive cultures of communities of color. We work to realize this vision through research, education, and community engagement. Furthermore, we strive to center the arts in all that we do because we see the arts as a way of remaining fully alive to the impossible tension at the heart of the modern concept of race. Race as both a means of domination and exploitation and a site of resistance, resilience, and recuperation. And did, indeed, we can see this tension in Professor Trethaway's poetry and prose as she poses her very existence as a crime according to Mississippi state law at, this, at the time of her birth and the source of transformative art. Professor Trethaway's publications and awards are voluminous, as we all know, and so I will read a condensed version simply to remind ourselves of the skill and accomplishment that anticipate this edifying moment. Pulitzer Prize winner Natasha Trethaway served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States, that was 2012 through 2014, while also serving as the Poet Laureate of the State of Mississippi from 2012 to 2016. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Memorial Drive, A Daughter's Memoir, 2020, Beyond Katrina, A Meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, 2010, and five collections of poetry, Monument, Poets, I'm, I'm sorry, Poems and Poems New and Selected, 2018, which was long listed for the 2018 National Book Award, Thrall, 2012, Native Guard, 2006, for which she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, Bellux Ophelia, 2002, and Domestic Work, 2000, which was selected by Rita Dove as the winner of the inaugural Kaveh Kahnem Poetry Prize for the best first book by an African-American poet. She is also the editor of The Essential Muriel Ruckheiser, 2021, Best New Poets, 20, 2007, 50 Poems from Emerging Writers, and Best American Poetry, 2017. 
She is the recipient of fellowships from the Academy of American Poets, the National Endowment of the Arts. I assure you, this is, this is the condensed version. <laughs> the Guggenheim Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Beinecke Library of, at Yale, and the Bunting Fellowship Program of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. From 2015 to 2016, she served as poetry editor of the New York Times Magazine. In 2017, she received the Heinz Award for Arts and Humanities, and in 2020, she received the Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry from the Library of Congress. A member of both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, she was selected to the Board of Chancellors of the American Academy of Poets in 2019. At Northwestern University, she is the Board of Trustees Professor of English in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. A poetry of history, memory, and memorialization, Professor Trethaway consistently intertwines national histories of race, always tied to the local, say, Ship Island, Mississippi, Vicksburg, or Stone Mountain, Georgia, with the intensely personal drama of remembering, forgetting, mourning, and celebrating family. Her poetry consistently asks us, how do we remember personal tragedy and loss? How do we forget? How do we, as a nation, reckon with a history of theft and murder visited upon blacks and Native Americans from nearly the very beginning? And how and why do we forget? As we each journey through our deepest sorrows, we are faced with a monumental challenge to affect the highest form of alchemy, to turn personal tragedy into song to convert debilitating misery into a gesture toward the ineffable, to make chaos into grace. Professor Trethaway's entire oeuvre serves as an instructive example of this alchemy, transforming her family's heartache and the national sin of slavery into elegy and eloquence, ultimately moving from despair to hope through the affirmation of art. Please join me in welcoming Professor Natasha Trethaway. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all for being here tonight. So I have to gather myself, sorry about that. Um, I want to um, start with uh, a poem that I was asked to write, um, a commission from the 1619 Project. Um, commissions are notoriously hard to do. Um, poems that are taken on commission often end up really bad. Um, I'm going to read this one anyway, because I, I think it's, it's not horrible. Um, but I felt like I had, a, I had a difficult assignment. It felt pretty prosaic, but it seems right to begin with this poem here. My assignment was to write about the Voting Rights Act. And I was lucky um, when I was given that assignment that I had a lot of letters that my mother had written to my father um, across their courtship and even uh, through their uh, marriage and into a few years after, in their, during their divorce, um, where issues of social justice and civil rights were often the topics. This one begins with uh, an epigraph from Justice Hugo Black, writing in 1964. No right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which, as good citizens, we must live. Other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is undermined. Quotidian. Sometimes she wrote about the weather, 
how hot it was, or yet another lightning storm, gone as quick as it came. In the catalog of her days, a dress she was sewing, car trouble, payday, laced with declarations of love to the man who would become my father. Her body bright with desire, a threshold I would soon cross into being. Two years before loving will make their love legal, my mother writes about marrying despite an unjust law. And because it is 1965, Mississippi in turmoil, she writes about a cross burned at the church next door, interracial outings at the beach, and being followed by police, all of it side by side in her letter's tidy script. Reading them, I can't help thinking how ordinary it seems, injustice, mundane as a trip to the store for bread. And I know this is about what has always existed side by side in this country. That summer, my grandmother brought the movement home. It tells the story in pictures, and it is beautiful, my mother wrote, adding, I think you know the way I'm using the word. On the cover, a black protester caught in a cop's chokehold, his mouth open to shout or gasp for air. Inside, pictures I could not bear to look at as a child. A man tied to a scaffold, his body burned blacker, the fire still smoldering beneath him. Two boys hanged from a tree above the smiling white faces of the revelers turned back toward the camera, a young couple holding hands, ordinary as any night out on a date. Now I think of my mother, in love and writing love letters, cataloging her days, those terrible, beautiful pictures on the table next to the crocheted lace doily and crystal bowl my grandmother kept for candy, butterscotch in cellophane wrappers, bright and shiny as gold. It is July 20th. 1965, two months before my parents will break the law to be married, and my mother, who's just turned 21, signs off her rights basic as any other citizens. Have to run, she wrote, got to get downtown to register to vote. <laughs> I always thought that was so lovely to see her, cons her, the idea that she believed she had the right to vote, that it should be just as ordinary as anyone else's right. Um, and, you know, this is sort of months, she's just turned 21, all I said, you know, months before. She's also, though, concerned about what the thing that Justice Hugo Black said. Um, you can't get these other rights. They're illusory if you don't have the right to vote. You know, and too often, you know, we hear these trumped up claims of voter fraud where there is none, when instead we should be paying attention to voter suppression through gerrymandering and intimidation and laws enacted to make access to the ballot harder for certain voters. And for too long, we've downplayed acts of domestic terrorism and the threat of increasingly virulent, vocal, and visible forms of white supremacy. When I was very small, my parents and I lived for a short amount of time with my grandmother in her house in Gulfport, Mississippi, which was right across the street from the Mount Olive Baptist Church. Now, this church was doing a voter registration drive in the late 60s to get disenfranchised African Americans registered to vote. They didn't have their own church bus, so my grandmother would let them park the bus in her driveway. We were, um, because of that, we were never quite sure if the act of domestic terrorism was directed at the church for the voter registration drive or the interracial family living inside the house. This is incident. We tell the story every year. 
how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shades drawn at the cross, trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross, trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered, white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our rooms and lit hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had all dimmed. When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. Um, I always like to tell folks when I read that poem um, something about being Poet Laureate of the United States. Um, I followed uh, a wonderful poet, uh, very much a, a, a labor poet, uh, the late Phil Levine, who um, was very political and um, in his 80s said whatever he needed to say. <laughs> um, and in an interview he gave, uh, he said that Congress was a den of vipers. Now, whether you agree with that or not, um, the problem was the Poet Laureate is a position created by Congress, um, housed in the Library of Congress, so they don't want you to make Congress that mad, um, but they also don't want to tell a poet what to do. I and mean, the Poet Laureate doesn't have to write poems about the president's dog or any poems for an occasion. It's, it's not that kind of position in the United States. So I had to go to Washington for a briefing um, before it was announced that I was the laureate. And what they told, they told me this story about Phil Levine and they said, you know, we don't care uh, what you say as long as you do it within the context of a poem. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> So just imagine me reading that poem and like this next one I'm about to read to members of Congress, um, which I did. Um, in his memorial to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Auden wrote, Mad Ireland Hurt You Into Poetry. Likewise, my Mississippi, my native land, my nation, with its brutal history of violence and racial oppression, inflicted my first wound. When I was born there, a year before this artist, by the way, um, uh, 1966, uh, miscegenation was still illegal in Mississippi and in as many as 20 other states in the nation. Uh, I was happy to read that she mentions loving in her statement, uh, loving in 1967, uh, in which the Supreme Court ruled that those laws were unconstitutional. And she also points out a thing I say, and that is that uh, the state of Alabama was among the last to get rid of these anti-miscegenation laws um, in 2000. 40% of the voting population voted to keep them e so that even symbolically it could be said that parents like mine couldn't be married legally and people like me born legally in the state. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. 
My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. My mother dreams another country. Already the words are changing. She is changing from colored to Negro, black still years ahead. This is 1966. She is married to a white man and there are more names for what grows inside her. It is enough to worry about words like mongrel and the infertility of mules and mulattoes while flipping through a book of baby names. She has come home to wait out the long months, her room unchanged since she's been gone, dolls winking down from every shelf, all of them white. Every day she is flanked by the rituals of superstition, and there is a name she will learn for this, too, maternal impression, the shape like an unknown country marking the back of the newborn's thigh. For now, women tell her to clear her head, to steady her hands, or she'll gray a lock of the child's hair wherever she worries her own, imprint somewhere the outline of a thing she craves too much. They tell her to stanch her cravings by eating dirt. All spring she is sat on her hands, her fingers numb. For a while each day she can't feel anything she touches. The arbor out back, the landscape's green tangle, the mole hill of her own swelling. Here, outside the city limits, cars speed by, clouds of red dust in their wake. She breathes it in, Mississippi then drifts towards sleep, thinking of some place she's never been. Late, Mississippi is a dark backdrop bearing down on the windows of her room. On the TV in the corner, the station signs off, broadcasting its nightly salutation, the waving stars and stripes, our national anthem. Southern Gothic. I have lain down into 1970, into the bed my parents will share for only a few more years. Early evening, they have not yet turned from each other in sleep, their bodies curved, parentheses framing the separate lives they'll wake to. Dreaming, I am again the child with too many questions, the endless why and why and why my mother cannot answer, her mouth closed, a gesture toward her future, cold lips stitched shut. The lines in my young father's face deepen toward an expression of grief. I have come home from the schoolyard with the words that shadow us in this small southern town. Peckerwood and nigger lover, half-breed and zebra, words that take shape outside us. We're huddled on the tiny island of bed, quiet in the language of blood, the house unsteady on its cinder block haunches, sinking deeper into the muck of ancestry. Oil lamps flicker around us, our shadows, dark glyphs on the wall, bigger and stranger than we are. <clears throat> You know, growing up um, in the Deep South, in Mississippi and in Georgia, I became, I think, acutely aware at an early age the ways in which the landscape was imprinted with the narrative of white supremacy. From the Confederate flag that flew in both of those places 
to all of the Confederate monuments honoring Confederate heroes um, who, of course, committed treason in order to destroy the Union to maintain slavery and white supremacy. They were everywhere. They were also, uh, the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, did a remarkable job of trying to control the narrative, not only that Southerners believed, but that all y'all believed around the nation about the causes of the war, which is why you still have people flying the flag claiming it's about heritage and not hate, but they never stop to say heritage of what, to do what, states' rights to do what, maintain slavery, maintain white supremacy. Those flags, the monuments, they are there to tell a certain group of people to know your place. The textbooks too, the Daughters of the Confederacy commissioned the writing of textbooks such that everyone was learning this similar history across the South. And when you think about textbooks now, that it's because the state of Texas is so big, that you know the textbooks that they choose are ones that go around the country. And so the narratives being inscribed into those textbooks are the ones that children are going to learn everywhere. Southern history. Before the war, they were happy, he said, quoting our textbook. This was senior year history class. The, cl the slaves were clothed, fed, and better off under a master's care. I watched the words blur on the page. No one raised a hand, disagreed, not even me. It was late. We still had reconstruction to cover before the test. And luckily, three hours of watching gone with the wind. History, the teacher said, of the Old South, a true account of how things were back then. On screen, a slave stood big as life, big mouth, Bucked eyes, our textbooks grinning proof, a lie my teacher guarded. Silent, so did I. <laughs> so something remarkable just happened um, the other day. I was home in Mississippi last week for the unveiling of the historical marker for Natasha Trethewey on the Mississippi Writers' Trail. So, you know, I joined Faulkner and Eudora Welty, but I also joined <laughs> Richard Wright and Margaret Walker Alexander and Ida B. Wells. Um, but what is remarkable is how concerned I've been with monuments and memorialization. Um, and so the real irony is that someone who has been writing about what is inscribed on the landscape and what is erased and what is forgotten now has a historical marker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I had to make a decision about where I wanted this marker to go. The, the living writers actually get to choose where it goes. So, um, you know, my book, Native Guard, was about um, the black soldiers who had guarded Ship Island, um, which is the barrier island off the coast of my hometown. Um, when Lincoln signed his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, they were mustered into service in September, October, and November. The 2nd Regiment of the Louisiana Native Guards were the ones stationed out on Ship Island. I used to go out on this, to this island every year with my grandmother on the 4th of July. There is a Confederate monument out there, an obelisk. Now this is a national park, mind you, but there's a Confederate monument there. Just think about that for a moment. Um, the, but there is no monument and no mention even from the park ranger, unless you know to ask, that the native guards had been stationed there and that they did what they did, guarding Confederate prisoners, having skirmishes. And so um, when I wrote this book, one of the things that happened um, 
was that a group of folks who had been trying to get a monument to the Native Guards were finally successful in getting a monument put up on the, the land, uh, on the mainland, so that you might see it um, before you go out there. Um, it is right near the dock where you board the boat for Ship Island, but not exactly there. It's kind of under a, a reproduction of a lighthouse that was on Ship Island. Um, and so you kind of have to walk over there and be looking for it. But they put mine directly by the ramp where you get on that boat. So, you know, there's people who go to the Riders Trail because they're interested, like people who go to the Blues Trail. This is going to get people who are just, you know, just going to get on the boat because it's a nice beach out there. And they're going to be forced to see this monument um, that also mentions the Native Guard. So I'm hoping that somehow People seeing that will lead them to know more about the history of these black soldiers uh, whose story has somewhat been erased. That was a long wind up for this poem. Um, it has an epigraph from Alan Tate that reads, now that the salt of their blood stiffens the saltier oblivion of the sea. Elegy for the native guards. We leave Gulfport at noon, gulls overhead trailing the boat streamers, noisy fanfare, all the way to Ship Island. What we see first is the fort, its roof of grass, a lee, half reminder of the men who served there, a weathered monument to some of the dead. Inside we follow the ranger, hurried though we are to get to the beach. He tells of graves lost in the gulf, the island split in half when Hurricane Camille hit. Shows us casemates, cannons, the store that sells souvenirs, tokens of history long buried. The Daughters of the Confederacy has placed a plaque here at the fort's entrance, each Confederate soldier's name raised hard in bronze, no names carved for the Native Guards, Second Regiment, Union Men, Black Phalanx. What is monument to their legacy? All the grave markers, all the crude headstones, water lost, now fish dart among their bones, and we listen for what the waves intone. Only the fort remains, near 40 feet high, round, unfinished, half open to the sky, the elements, wind, rain, God's deliberate eye. This has an epigraph from E.O. Wilson that reads, Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. South. I return to a stand of pines, bone-thin phalanx flanking the roadside, tangle of understory, a dialectic of dark and light, and magnolias blossoming like afterthought, each flower a surrender, white flags draped among the branches. I returned to Land's End, the swath of coast clear-cut and buried in sand, mangrove, live oak, gulf weed raised and replaced by thin palms, palmettos, symbols of victory or defiance, over and over, marking this vanquished land. I returned to a field of cotton, hallowed ground as slave legend goes, each bowl holding the ghosts of generations, those who measured their days by the heft of sacks and links of rows, whose sweat flecked the cotton plants still sewn into our clothes. I returned to a country battlefield where colored troops fought and died, Port Hudson where their bodies swelled and blackened beneath the sun, unburied until earth's green sheet pulled over them, unmarked by any headstones. Where the roads, buildings, and monuments are named to honor the Confederacy, where that old flag still hangs, I return to Mississippi, state that made a crime of me. Mulatto, half-breed, native in my native land, this place, they'll bury me.
going to read a couple more poems. The book that came after that was a book dedicated to my father, a book called Thrall. When I was uh, finishing Native Guard, I was doing something that I always do, which is to look up words, all the words in the dictionary, words that I think I know, um, to be reminded of their secondary and tertiary, on and on definitions. When I was looking up the word native, I was very surprised that um, the, the definition that came up was not what I'd expected. I'd expected, uh, you know, something that equated with the idea of being a native of a place. I'm a native Mississippi, and there are plants that are native to Indiana. Um, but instead, what came up was someone born into the condition of servitude, a thrall. So uh, it has embedded in it this idea of empire and colonialism. When we go there to colonize those people, they are uh, in thrall to us. And so I began to think about all the different meanings of that word thrall. Um, and the conversation that I needed to have in this book dedicated to my father was a very difficult uh, conversation um, about race, about the deeply ingrained and often unexamined notions of racial difference and hierarchy, first codified by Enlightenment philosophers in the 18th century, that were in many ways, you know, the, 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 the precursors to 19th century scientific racism and the bedrock of uh, even seemingly benign uh, forms of white supremacy. Is it funny to hear like benign and white supremacy? But what I mean by that is the way that even in the intimate relationships in families with a father who loved me dearly, he could not fully unyoke himself from some of those ideas of difference and hierarchy. When people don't understand it, I look at the women and say, think about your dads, even you white women. Um, if they didn't believe in the equality of your humanity and possibility because you were female then, maybe you understand what I mean. I needed to have this conversation with him in the only language he would listen to, and that was the language of poetry. My father was also a poet, and we often stood at podiums just like this and read poems together. You'll hear a line from his poem in this poem. Uh, there was a moment at which um, there's a lovely poem of his called Her Swing, and for 40 years, it took me to figure out what was troubling me about this line that you'll hear. This is after a chalk drawing by J. H. Hasselhorst, 1864. <coughs> Knowledge. Whoever she was, she comes to us like this. Lips parted, long hair spilling from the table like water from a pitcher. Nipples drawn out for inspection. Perhaps to foreshadow the object she'll become, a skeleton on a pedestal, a row of skulls on a shelf. To make a study of the ideal female body, four men gather around her. She is young and beautiful and drowned, a Venus de Medici risen from the sea, sleeping. As if we could mistake this work for sacrilege, the artist entombs her body in a pyramid of light, a temple of science over which the anatomist presides. In the service of beauty, to know it, he lifts a flap of skin beneath her breast as one might draw back a sheet. We will not see his step-by-step -step parsing, a translation. Mary or Catherine or Elizabeth, to Corpus, Ariela, Vulva. In his hands, instruments of the empirical, scalpel, pincers, cold as the room must be cold, all the men in coats, trimmed in velvet or fur, soft as the down of her pubis. Now one man is smoking, another tilts his head to get a better look. Yet another, at the head of the table, peers down as if enthralled, his fist on a stack of books. 
In the drawing, this is only the first cut, a delicate wounding. And yet, how easily the anatomist blade opens a place in me, like a curtain drawn upon a room in which each learned man is my father. And I hear again his words. I study my crossbreed child. Misnomer and taxonomy, the language of zoology. Here he is all of them, the preoccupied man, an artist, collector of experience, the skeptic angling his head, his thoughts tilting toward what I cannot know, the marshaller of knowledge, knuckling down a stack of books, even the dissector, his scalpel in hand like a pen poised above me, aimed straight for my heart. In order to write this book, I had to take my father to Monticello, uh, Thomas Jefferson's home. He first took me there over 30 years ago, and um, a lot of things have changed at Monticello since then. Um, whereas it was once taboo to even bring up Sally Hemings, now it is the official position of the Jefferson Foundation that he indeed fathered several of her children. And the docent will mention this as you begin the tour. Um, so the conversations that one might overhear have changed, but I think that the underlying ideology has not. Enlightenment. In the portrait of Jefferson that hangs at Monticello, he is rendered two-toned, his forehead white with illumination, a lit bulb, the rest of his face in shadow, darkened as if the artist meant to contrast his bright knowledge, its dark subtext. By 1805, when Jefferson sat for the portrait, he was already linked to an affair with his slave. Against a backdrop blue and ethereal, a wash of paint that seems to hold him in relief, Jefferson gazes out across the centuries, his lips fixed as if he's just uttered some final word. The first time I saw the painting, I listened as my father explained the contradictions, how Jefferson hated slavery, though out of necessity, my father said, had to own slaves. That his moral philosophy meant he could not have fathered those children would have been impossible, my father said. For years, we debated the distance between word and deed. I'd follow my father from book to book, gathering citations, listen as he named, like a field guide to Virginia, each flower and tree and bird, as if to prove a man's pursuit of knowledge is greater than his shortcomings, the limits of his vision. I did not know then the subtext of our story, that my father could imagine Jefferson's words made flesh in my flesh, the improvement of the blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites, or that my father could believe he'd made me better. When I think of this now, I see how the past holds us captive, its beautiful ruin etched on the mind's eye. My young father, a rough outline of the old man he's become, needing to show me the better measure of his heart, an equation writ large at Monticello. That was years ago. Now we take in how much has changed. Talk of Sally Hemings, someone asking, how white was she? Parsing the fractions as if to name what made her worthy of Jefferson's attentions, a near white quadroon mistress, not a plain black slave. Imagine stepping back into the past our guide tells us then, and I can't resist whispering to my father, this is where we split up. I'll head around to the back. When he laughs, I know he's grateful I've made a joke of it. This history that links us, white father, black daughter, even as it renders us other 
to each other. And I think um, just two more. Some of you may know about um, that Thomas Jefferson in Notes on the State of Virginia was probably the first person to call for a kind of comparative anatomy. He believed that if you were to cut the Negro open, you'd be able to ascertain what he thought would, was the root of black inferiority. In the 19th century, there were doctors who did this kind of work. Uh, one famous one was Dr. Samuel Adolphus Cartwright. He was also the doctor who came up with the wonderful disease, drapedomania, that he uh, said that uh, slaves who were trying to escape to freedom had this disease. It was a disease to want to escape slavery to freedom. This is Dr. Samuel Adolphus Cartwright on dissecting the white Negro, 1851. To strip from the flesh the specious skin, to weigh in the brain pan seeds of white pepper, to find in the body its own diminishment, blood deep and definite, to measure the heft of lack, to make of the work of faith the work of science, evidence the word of God, Canaan be the servant of servants, thus to know the truth of this, this derelict corpus, a dark compendium, this atavistic assemblage, flatter feet, bowed legs, a shorter neck, so deep the tincture, see it? We still know white from not. <clears throat> And I want to finish with uh, this last poem. Um, it's called Miracle of the Black Leg. And um, the Black Leg miracle, uh, the myth of the, of the miracle of the Black Leg, it's a, a 13th century miracle um, that was supposedly performed by the patron saints of medicine, the brothers Cosmas and Damien. Uh, a white sacristan had a diseased leg and needed a replacement. Angels came down and said, here's where to get one. Go get this leg and, and fix this, uh, this white sacristan. Um, the pictorial representations first started appearing in altarpieces and paintings in the 14th century and across many countries um, and centuries, we get representations of this myth. Um, when I was working on this book, I, I wanted to see how far back I might be able to go um, to find representations of difference and hierarchy. And um, I was in my office and I pulled down a book from the shelf um, called The Panorama of the Renaissance. And there was a chapter on race in the Renaissance. And that's where I saw for the first time one of these um, black leg paintings. As I left my office, I was walking out of there sort of asking myself how there came to be this black donor. Um, how did he come to give his leg? What can these images tell us about our current moment, about notions of superiority and its conjoined twin, the notion of inferiority? which is the bedrock of contemporary ideas about whose, life ma whose lives matter and whose lives are repeatedly shown to matter less. These are what the images seem to show again and again, whether the donor was dead or in later versions, a live donor. Miracle of the Black Leg. Always the dark body hewn asunder. Always one man is healed, his sick limb replaced, placed in the other man's grave, the white leg buried beside the corpse or attached as if it were always there. If not for the dark appendage, you might miss the story beneath this story. What remains each time the myth changes. How, in one version, the doctors harvest the leg from a man four days dead in his tomb at the church of a martyr or in another, desecrate a body fresh in the graveyard at St. Peter in Chains. There was buried just today an Ethiopian. 
Even now, it stays with us. When we mean to uncover the truth, we dig, say, unearth. Emblematic in paint, a signifier of the body's lacuna, the black leg is at once a grafted narrative, a redacted line of text, and in this scene, a dark stocking pulled above the knee. Here, the patient is sleeping, his head at rest in his hand. Beatific, he looks as if he'll wake from a dream. On the floor, beside the bed, a dead moor. Hands crossed at the groin, the swapped limb white and rotting, fused in place. And in the corner, a question, poised as if to speak the syntax of sloughing a snake's curved form. It emerges from the mouth of a boy like a tongue, slippery and rooted in the body as knowledge. For centuries, this is how the myth repeats the miracle in words or wood or paint is a record of thought. See how the story changes. In one painting, the Ethiop is merely a body, featureless in a coffin, so black he has no face. In another, the patient at the top of the frame seems to writhe in pain, the black leg grafted to his thigh. Below him, a mirror of suffering, the blackamoor, his body a fragment, arched across the doctor's lap as if dying from his wound. If not imminence, the soul's bright anchor, blood passed from one to the other, what knowledge haunts each body? What history, what phantom ache? One man always low, in a grave or on the ground, the other up high, closer to heaven. One man always diseased, the other a body in service, plundered. Both men are alive in Violdo's carving. In twinned relief, they hold the same posture, the same pained face, each man reaching to touch his left leg. The black man on the floor holds his stump. Above him, the doctor restrains the patient's arm as if to prevent him touching the dark amendment of flesh. How not to see it, the men bound one to the other, symbiotic, one man rendered expendable, the other worthy of this sacrifice. Inversion after version, even when the Ethiopian isn't there, the leg is a stand-in, a black modifier against the white body, a piece cut off as in the origin of the word comma. Sejura in a story that's still being written. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was moving and difficult like art is supposed to be. Um, we have time. Uh, if you're willing to answer questions or field questions, sure, we have uh, time. So if, if um, people have questions or comments, um, I think we have some people online as well who may be writing in. So okay. you want to let us know if people are writing in questions. Uh, right. This is the moment to uh, please stand up. Uh, give us your name and um, please address Professor. So, thank you. Thank you. I mean, and, and as Mark said, that was incredibly intimate and powerful and beautiful. And I, I don't have a question per se, I just want to comment that all of your stories about Mississippi, I'm from South Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, we're cousins, mm -hmm. um, historically <laughs> and otherwise. Um, you know, and it just brought home, you know, the, the, this notion of white supremacy and resistance to it. Mm -hmm. um, and your, your words were just beautiful, so thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, South Carolina beat Mississippi taking the flag down. <laughs> no? Good for you. <laughs> well, when, I, when I was in school there, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was one of the worst public school systems in the country. And we used to say, thank God for Mississippi. Yeah. For 49, we never did beat it. Yeah, you know, we, we hung on to that flag as long as we could. <laughs> you know, there was a politician who got reelected um, a couple of years ago on the flag issue that it was never coming down and then we know what happened uh, george floyd and the protests and even mississippi couldn't hold on to it anymore even mississippi i have a question um my name is scott so i've talked to you a little bit in the past but i you have given me another way to look at your particularly your last poem because in the work i do in brazil it's a holiday that is sort of the child that Halloween and Thanksgiving could have mm -hmm. for black people. And they celebrate Cosmos and Damien, Cosmos and Dummy Up. And it's, I could go on. But I'm curious in relation to what you presented with us about the process. Mm -hmm. Because you obviously, in many of the works that are not specific to your own heritage, mm -hmm. there's a depth of historicization and an inquiry, and I'm curious, a poem like that, where does it begin for you mm -hmm. that ends up revealing so much, so many layers? Mm -hmm. How, you know, can you share a little bit of, and it doesn't have to be that one, but. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think two things, you know, well, three, as I mentioned before, just the all the questions that were swirling around just from looking at those images, I wanted to understand uh, something about the context in which they were made, what they would have said to the people worshiping in a place who saw them, what subliminal messages were they sending, what did they reinforce. And, you know, a lot of these came into being um, uh, in Italy, for example, before the slave trade. So what were people seeing and, and what did they mean to people? And they took on a different meaning, you know, with the arrival of the slave trade, with all the things you can imagine. But before that, what did they mean? I, was, I, I wanted to do research to figure that out, to see as much as I could about that. So turning to the work of art historians and historians. Um, and then the other part is to just look at the images themselves. It seemed to me incontrovertible fact that we see hierarchy as human beings. That if we see something always here and something's always here, one always seems higher than the other. Um, and in every instance that I saw these, uh, I looked at many of them, um, the, the dark body, the black body was um, in a grave being desecrated. So whose graves will we rob? You know, who, who are we willing to take from to make use of? So those were in the ground um, or they were on the floor beneath the, the, the bed or the platform on which the white sacristan was. Everything, or it, they weren't even there anymore. I was also interested, you know, so one of the things I learned about was that in some of the images, because it also coincides with the development of medicine yes. and ideas about medicine. So there are some with, you know, the brothers who are uh, just really angels, they, you know, they have their halo, they are, uh, their corona, they're performing this instrument, an angel is looking on, they're performing with their hands as if this was sort of, but then other ones you begin to see their medical instruments. You see them as doctors, no longer the corona, but as physicians with medical instruments. When they seem to care about the wholeness of the body, that you could not advance to heaven if you were not whole, that's when you would see the white leg reattached, the diseased white leg attached to the black body. So the black body would still be whole, but it was now taking on the disease mm. in order to mm. save the sacristan. Um, and then sometimes, you know, you wouldn't, they were no longer attaching it and you would just see the, the diseased white leg um, discarded 
and the black leg um, attached. It, at first, it was really hard to find, and I did not, this is when I was still at Emory, the first time I actually found in, in um, books about it was in the medical library. So I had to go to the medical library to start doing research about the black leg. But so a, a bit of that, but really just reading as closely as I could the images um, and thinking about what they said to us in this moment. And, you know, I, I wrote this poem in this book came out in 2012. But it really does speak to me about uh, Black Lives Matter. I mean, because it is showing again and again which life doesn't seem to matter as much as the one being saved. Quick addendum. NYU, where I used to be, has a villa in Florence that some alumni gave. Mm -hmm. And it has something like 56 Blackamores in it. Uh -huh. And Deb Willis does this thing called Black Portraiture around the, cult, the, around the world mm -hmm. about how we're seen and how we want to be seen. And so they have one in Florence, and she walks in and goes, What's up with this? The people who owned and managed it had never seen, like, they didn't see it. Yeah. They had become so integrated, they didn't realize. Right. And they're like, you know, they're um, on staircases as the finial at light, but they're all over the house, yeah. these little black men. Right. And so it became then for that iteration mm -hmm. about what is, like you just did for us, what is unseen that's invisible in plain right. sight. It's like the air we breathe. It's yeah. there, yeah. but we don't really. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I thank you again. And thank all of you for coming. Yes, thank you. Um, I do, again, encourage you to continue to visit us here at the Civil Rights Heritage Center for our upcoming events. Um, I think it'll be hard to top this one, but we're going to work on it. <laughs> so enjoy your evening, get home safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.